Thank you for joining me. I'm Nancy Zeman. Today on Sewing with Nancy, we'll be taking a journey in first class sewing. Many of you have asked for updated garment techniques or requested beginner skills, but you don't want to learn to sew on an apron or pillow. You want something stylish, something first class. The first class shirt has all the style and easy elements to start you on the road to easy, enjoyable sewing. I'll start you on streamlined techniques and proceed to creative options. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is brought to you by FOF, the largest European producer of sewing machines. FOF's creative line of sewing machines and Hobby Lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira, superior quality threads from Germany, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz Collins and Omnigrid. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery. Over 200 disc pack collections currently available, including designs by Nancy Zeman. Koala Cabinets from Australia, quality crafted, fully assembled sewing furniture, designed for maximum storage in minimum space. Rowenta, professional performance and beautiful results for all types of ironing, the choice of professionals. And Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. The pattern that I'm using in this series is designed by Lois Erickson, perfect for beginner sewers or refreshing your sewing techniques. It has six basic pattern pieces, front and back, plus sleeve, collar, and then pages or panels in the front. These panels are perfect for designing options and accent options or different fabrics. We've used rayon fabric. You could use other lightweight fabrics. Rayon is the perfect choice for this project. And I'm going to show you some other color combinations. The pattern that I'm going to cut out is going to be in the taupe and black combination. We're going to use this wood grain color for the basic shirt and then for the panels, these two other options. I like to pre-wash my rayon fabrics dip them in cold water and then line dry and press flat. That way I can hand wash the fabric later on. I'll set aside the panel pieces and then just teach you or review with you some basic cutout principles after pre-washing your fabric and pressing it. I like to match the selvages or those finished edges at one end and then create the fold on the opposite end so the fabric has been folded in half. The front, back and sleeve will be cut double layers plus the collar. The grain line, kind of like the straight of grain or the straight road that you travel on, follows the length of the fabric. And when positioning it on the fabric, the pattern on the fabric that is, I place one pin at the top of the arrow and measure from the arrow to the fold, it's eight inches, then I move down to the end of the arrow, find the salvage area, and then make sure that that second arrow is at also at eight inches, and then pin. That will keep everything on the straight grain for your sewing journey. Now I don't do a lot of pinning. I really just pin corners and every couple of areas I don't put a lot of pins in because then you have to take them out after you've, done, after you've done some cutting. And just cut pin in corners. Make sure you are pinning flat and anchor that pattern piece down. Some pattern pieces, particularly the back, will be placed on the fold of the fabric. Again, making sure your selvages are matching at the top place then the back piece on the fold of the fabric and way down at the bottom you can see that the fold is matching the fold of the pattern and you'll see an arrow on the back pattern piece that coincides with the fold of the fabric. The other pattern pieces, the sleeve will be cut double, the collar will be cut double and again match those grain lines, the short little arrow making certain it runs with the length of the fabric. And, and you'll see that this pattern piece will not will be a kind of a small, funny looking piece. This is an asymmetrical collar, one of the great design features of this pattern. When cutting out silky or lightweight fabric, such as rayon, I like to use a micro serrated scissors. It has a kind of a little gridded edge along one blade, catching the fabrics making it easy to take nice long strides to cut around the edges. Trust me, it's easier to cut out on a flat surface than what I'm using right now, but just take time to enjoy the process of cutting out. 
After you've cut out this pattern piece, you'll need to do some marking as well as to do some interfacing to give some stability and shape to this pattern. First of all, markings. For those of you who have sewn before, you maybe are familiar with notches. Well, notches are little markings to know which pattern pieces should align, and they're little arrows in this instance. We cut them off. We don't cut around them. We just cut them off and then place a little nip or clip, a quarter of an inch clip, marking the fabric piece. I think it's much more accurate than trying to cut around a shape. Sometimes you may see them going out into the seam allowance. Interfacing is what next, and we're going to put interfacing on the panels and the collar. Full fuse, fusing the interfacing, the full size of the fabric shape. A very lightweight drapeable. Can you see how this kind of just kind of floated in the air going down? You don't want a lot of heavy weight, just something to give it some body. Align it because it's been cut to the same size. Get it aligned. Here we go and then steam baste it, just a little corner of the tip of your iron, get it positioned. And I need to position this just a little bit better so that it's basted into place and then cover with a press cloth as the instructions inform you and press. Give it a burst of steam and take some time to go around the pattern piece to make sure it's fused properly. So you've fused the panels and both colors, both upper and under collar. And now I'd like to share with you some basic seaming techniques on rayons. One of the first things that I like to do when starting to sew is to finish the edges of the fabric so it doesn't ravel, especially on rayons. They're very prone to raveling. Some fabrics can withstand just a simple zigzag over the edges, but on lightweight, drapeable fabrics, you may get some tunneling or even end up with little extra whiskers of fabric that you really don't want. I'm going to suggest that you clean finish the edges using a trim that finishes the edge. It's made for edge trimming. It's bias cut treacle on the roll, 5 eighths of an inch wide, and when you give it a tug, it curls just in one direction. It cups over the edge. You're going to still use that zigzag stitch, but cup and wrap the product over the edge and zigzag. It will give it a little extra weight and will keep those little whiskers of your fabric from peeking through. And as you're sewing, you simply place the fabric over half of the trim, wrap it around the edge, and sew. It will enclose all those edges and keep it nice and trim and neat. Now it is a nylon product, so you have to be careful not to use an extra hot iron, but it certainly will give those seam finishes a very neat appearance and longevity to your garment. If you are fortunate enough to have a serger, or a friend that has a serger, you may want to have the edges surged, as on this sample shows. But these are two great examples for finishing the edges on rayon type fabrics or silky fabrics. On our shirt, we have many options or abilities or areas, I should say, to have mitered corners. On these front panels, the corners are shaped. In the wrong side, it looks like a picture frame, the seam going down the center. I'll show you how to shape that. The other areas where you'll have these mitered corners are in the vents on the lower edge. You'll have a nice mitered corner option. To sew the miter of the corner, it's very simple. It just requires a little tape. Tape, it could be uh, office or school supply tape or special sewing tape and one or two measurements. We're using 5 eighths of an inch seam allowances, so we're going to double that number. 5 eighths equals 1 and a fourth. And I have already measured 1 and a fourth inches from each corner of the front flap. And I have marked it with a marking pen. From the wrong side of the fabric, at these two markings, I'm going to place a piece of extra long tape from the top of the marking to the top of the opposite marking, placing this extra long tape across the wrong side of the fabric. Then fold the corner in half, and this is where you are going to match the tape edges, those extra long tape edges. They'll work as pins, and I'm simply going to sew across the top edge of the tape. That will give me a mitered corner. I'm going to change back to a straight stitch on my machine. And the first time around, you may want to lengthen the stitch just to make sure that it's 
a little longer so that if you need to pull it out, you can easily do that. And I'm just going to sew across that top of the tape edge. Simple as that. Now normally, or afterwards, I'll trim off this excess corner. But right now I'm going to leave it there just to double check my work. Probably the hardest part of this job is taking off the tape. So I've taken it off. I'll get it off my fingers. And now I'll do some finger pressing, just kind of pressing that seam allowance to the side and inverting it. And I'll use a little bamboo piece or to point and creaser to see if that works. And how about that? Now I'd recommend restitching that little seam and trimming off the excess seam allowance. And you can press your corners perfectly. I'd now like to share with you some basic seaming techniques and I'll review this technique by teaching you the collar treatment. This collar is really fun because it's asymmetrical, you don't have to have your edges even, and it's reversible from both sides, or you see both sides of the collar. So we'll just be doing some basic seaming, but sew this collar in three seams. The first step is a button loop. For beginner sewers or refresher sewing ideas, rather than working with buttonholes, I like button loops. It's easier to work with. I've cut strips of fabric that are about an inch and a half wide, folded right sides together and sewed down the center. Then thread it onto a turner or use your favorite turner idea, put it on the cylinder. I have the little pigtail wire in the middle of the turner and it comes out the end and that's going to hook the tube so as I pull this, it's going to invert the tube to make a button loop. Then I'm going to turn that wire counterclockwise and I have it removed and I have a button loop. The button loop is going to be cut one and a fourth inches longer, that's a two seam allowances width than your button opening needs to be. What I'd really like you to do is to test it out on your button that you have chosen and baste it, just straight stitch it to the marking on your pattern where the button loop placement should be. And test to see if that fits your buttonhole. If not, make it a little longer, a little shorter. And now we can sew the collar. The collar edge is going to be shown, stitched in three steps. The top edge, and then after sewing that, then we'll stitch each front edge. I'm going to make certain, and I had it upside down, excuse me, here's the top edge, and then we'll sew each lower edge. When I sew a collar, I like to make certain, or any seam allowance, that my notches are matching, and I can see my little notches there, and I pin with the head of the pin toward the cut edge, so I can easily remove the pins prior to getting to the seam area. Notice the full fuse of interfacing on both sides of the collar. It really works best to have the interfacing on both collars, not just one. Then as I begin to sew, I'm just going to sew from the cut edge to cut edge with my 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. And I don't use a lot of seams. I should say, I don't use a lot of pins. I use a lot of seaming. Excuse me, and just sew along the collar top edge. And I'm just going to sew half of it for you now. Then after sewing this, then I'm pressing. I'm going to press the seam flat just the way I stitched it. It always works best on a seam. If you press it flat, then it will press open with greater ease. And since this has a slight curve to it, I'm going to press open the seam over a slight curve. And separate the seams. And I think my little interfacing has caught, but here we go. Press it open, and, I, and sometimes even finger pressing works well, but we'll just press that. Now for the collar, we're going to grade. Grade the seam allowances, one smaller than the other. And for this collar that's reversible, it really doesn't matter which one you make smaller. And I'll just trim, and then I'll quickly show you how to sew that front edge. You would do the trimming all the way along the collar. But right now, I'd like you to sew the center front edge, folding the collar along the stitched line, along that stitched line. And I'm going to sew from the fold down. And this will give a very sharp corner to my collar. And it's a very quick little seam. And when I turn this right side out, again, I always test it first before trimming. Notice how that seam allowance has wrapped around. I'm just going to invert it and use again my pointer and creaser to get those edges even. And there's my corner, very sharp. 
Do the same on the other collar end. There are many basic seaming techniques on this first class shirt. First of all, stitching the panels, which I showed you how to finish, to the fronts. This is the left front of the shirt, and on the other side we have another panel already stitched to the neckline of the front. After the panels were stitched into place, then the shoulder seams, front and back, were sewn together, which I have done off camera. I'd like to review quickly that collar again to show you that after stitching the front edges of each collar, make certain that you go back and trim the excess seam allowances, grade them, making one layer longer than the other, and pressing so that you have neatly pressed and finished collar shapes. We're going to attach the collar next, and notice that we've pre-pressed under one of the seam allowances just so it gives me a sewing guide. Sometimes pressing, if you press accurately and mark it, it'll help you do the sewing. On the right side of this front panel, I have aligned the collar to the neckline and I stitched the two together, just one layer of the collar using a 5 8 of an inch seam allowance, a standard seam allowance width. On the inside, I did some trimming, grading the seam allowances, one seam allowance smaller than the next so that that bulk will not be there. By pre-pressing the collar, this wraps around the neckline edge, folds under, and you can pin the collar to the neckline. And with some hand stitching, which I like to do a little hand stitching in this area to attach the inside of the collar. And with those simple steps, your collar has been attached. So that's what I'd need to finish to do on the opposite side of this collar. And as I said, the collar edges are asymmetrical, which is perfect for re-entry or beginner sewers because you don't have to get them to match. So basic seaming is what we're going to be talking about to finish this shirt, and particularly when putting the sleeve in or setting the sleeve into the shirt itself. Shirt pattern pieces do not have as much ease as blouse pattern pieces. I'm speaking of the sleeve. The sleeve is somewhat larger than the front, and here I have started to pin the sleeve to the armhole matching the notches and you can see that lower layer is a little bit larger than the top layer. Rather than having to ease it, I'm going to let my machine do it for me. All machines are set up in the same manner. They have feed docks. The funny term that of the little grid surface underneath the presser foot that bites the fabric as it goes through, helps it advance through. The longer layer will always kind of ease in if you have a feed dog, or dual feed, excuse me, disengage the dual feed so that the feed dogs work to their fullest potential, will ease in that longer layer. So whenever I have one layer longer than the other, I always make certain that I disengage the dual feed, put the longer layer next to the feed dogs, and stitch. And I'm just going to get this positioned. There we go. And I'm not going to do a lot of pinning in this area. I just usually like to finger pin. I pinned at the starting point and at the center seam, the shoulder seam. And then I'm going to let my machine do the work for me. Just sew. And that bottom layer eases into place. And I'm going to sew again, making sure that those edges are aligned. And here, I'll straighten this out a little bit so the top layers are not going to get caught. And I'll sew half the sleeve for you, and you can see what this looks like. Even though that layer was longer, when the machine eased it for me, that sleeve fit into the armhole with ease. A little pressing, and the sleeve will be set in. After setting the sleeves into your shirt, the next step would be to sew the underarm seams as well as sew the hem from the sleeve and the lower edge of the shirt. Sew with a friend if you're a beginner sewer or even if you're a re-entry sewer. In our next segment, I'll show you some more ideas on this shirt. At home and at my studio, I sew with Koala cabinets because of their perfect design. There's no waste of time in getting started. Because of the Koala soft touch airlift system, the machine quickly and gently raises to the perfect sewing position. The design allows me to sit directly in front of the needle in clear view of my work with no strain on my neck or back. And Koala has a place for all my favorite notions and supplies. I always feel more efficient and more motivated to do my best work when my space is organized. A perfect design 
That's why I sew with Koala. Here's a hint from Ginger. When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching, and the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. Here's a hint from Adira. Adding a layer of stabilizer to the top or bottom of a project is an important step, giving extra stability to the fabric. For most of my projects, I prefer Avalon by Madeira. This water-soluble stabilizer has double the strength of comparable stabilizers. I simply place the Avalon underneath the fabric, giving the fabric some general stability. If working with nap fabrics like fleece or corduroy, to keep the threads from embedding into the nap, place the Avalon on top and underneath the fabric. When finished, just simply tear away the majority of the stabilizer and spritz the rest away. First class sewing is a topic for this mini-series on Sewing with Nancy. Thanks for joining me. We're in the second program of this three-part series where I'm teaching you updated sewing skills on a pattern that has first-class style. Lois Erickson is the designer of the pattern and gave us two creative options. In this program, you'll learn sewing skills on the jewel neckline version of the first-class shirt. It has creative potential for special touches on the front panel. Discover the joy of sewing basics and creative touches next on Sewing with Nancy. In the first program of First Class Sewing, I went over some of the very basics of sewing, cutting techniques, marking, using interfacing, and basic seaming. And I did all this making this shirt, or a sample of this shirt, like I'm wearing. I have rayon fabric, a couple of samples or different styles of rayon fabric in this shirt. The same pattern has another option, and the option is on the mannequin, and it can be made without a collar and more streamlined with just one decorative flap in the front. You can see we've added machine embroidery at the top, plus the neckline trim, and also carried that machine embroidery through in the opening, around the opening for the belt, and then have the reverse coloration done on the closure for the sleeve. The sewing on this pattern is very simple, lots of straight stitching, so that's why I'm going to introduce the creative element of working with embroidery at this time. Fabrics to use for this pattern range from rayons, lightweight cottons, drapable polyesters, something that you would like for a drapable shirt. And you could use two different fabrics, reversible fabrics like the one on the finished on the mannequin. The choice is yours. There is no limit when it comes to sewing because you get to decide on the fabrics and the pattern combinations. Marking is a critical thing for this particular pattern to mark the belt opening. We're going to be making a little window opening in a while. And in order to have the window opening, you need to refer to your pattern piece. And on the pattern piece, there is an opening marked for the various sizes down below in the waistline area. And I have transferred that to the front as well as to the back of this piece of fabric using a disappearing marking pen. Now the other markings that I went over during the first program were these little notches. The notches that are on the pattern mark which pieces go together. You could also mark the notches with a little mark from your marking pen, or as I denoted earlier, simply just give it a little clip and you have the notches to align the areas. If you did not have an embroidery machine, let's say you wanted appliques, you would also position the appliques before you actually did the sewing. And we're going to position the embroidery. I'd like to make sample embroidery using my embroidery machine and stitch it on a crisp piece of fabric and then from this point make a template. The template can be made by simply using this fabric as a template, marking the inner position of the hoop, and there's a light blue line marking this, marking T for top at the very top and B for bottom if you'd like, and then cut out this unit to use as your template for positioning. Or, if you'd like, you could simply, after making your design, make a clear template from a quilting fabric or Templar, it's called a plastic fabric, outline your design. With either material, you need to position this on your fabric so you know where you'd like your design placed. And I'm going to center this right over the opening for the belt and position the plastic or the fabric template. In my embroidery hoop, I have already positioned a sticky back stabilizer. 
When you remove the top, I just scored the top paper with a pinpoint. Just remove that top paper, you get the sticky back, and center or place the template within the circle, fitting, fitting it exactly to the size of the template if it was this size, or just positioning it within the open area. And then I'll be ready to embroider the design. For those of you who do not have an embroidery unit for your sewing machine, around the belt opening, around this flap of the front of the shirt is a great opportunity to try some applique or creative stitching, perhaps double needle stitching. But since I've started to work with embroidery, let me show you how, to, how, it finishes, how I should finish this and follow through. You notice I didn't put the fabric in the hoop, but rather I put the stabilizer in the hoop and then the fabric on top of the sticky back area. The reason, obviously the fabric is smaller, doesn't take up the whole width of the hoop, and you need that fabric nice and taut. So I'd like to use a sticky back stabilizer for that purpose. Now I have the template, and I'm not going to sew over the template, it is just a guideline, and I'll set my machine up so I can place this into the machine. I'll raise the machine into the free arm position so that I can attach the embroidery unit. Now you'll have to follow the manufacturer's instructions for your various, for whatever type of machine you have to get it set up for embroidery. I have dropped the feed dogs. I have attached a embroidery foot. I have an embroidery needle in the machine and I've used rayon thread, embroidery thread in the top of the machine and the bob and I used a lightweight thread. I'm going to place my design in my machine and turn my machine on. I'm going to select the design that I've chosen to go around the belt opening. And I, I'm going to right now position my hoop underneath the presser foot area and get it locked into place. And then I'll make sure I get the design position just in the right area. Now the beauty of working with templates, whether they're fabric templates or plastic templates, is to get the starting position correct. From where I'm sitting, I can see the starting spot or the middle spot, which I have made an opening with a paper punch, is about a half of an inch from the area of my needle. So I'm simply going to walk my needle over to that area so that I'm going to start right in that position. Let me move over a little bit. You can see here's the opening so I'm just going to get the two aligned and as I put my needle down, yep, I'm starting right in the center area. Remove the template, place the machine in the sewing position and it walks over to the first area and start to stitch. And I stitch a few stitches, clip the top thread, let me do a few more stitches, there we go, and let it sew. Now, I just forgot to do something, and that is put the stabilizer. I always need to put another stabilizer underneath. I so often forget to do this, that this trick works so well. If you have your stabilizer and you forgot to put it underneath, cut a slit into it. And then you can slide it underneath the foot and the hoop and get it around the area that has just been stitched. And no one will ever know I haven't sewn. I'll let this sew, and off camera, I will finish this, but in about five or so minutes, I'll have the decorative stitching complete that's going to go around the belt opening, and then I'll show you how to do this opening. Off camera, I finished doing the embroidery, the wrought iron design around the opening of the belt, or what will be the opening of the belt. And I just wanted to briefly show you the stitching that it was accomplished, and then show it to you on the flip side, because you saw that I added that stabilizer at the last minute, and it worked out just fine. Now to remove the stabilizer, first remove the fabric from the hoop, set the hoop aside, and then I like to hold the fabric firmly with one hand and remove the tearaway stabilizer with the other. Now the stabilizer that's been put on with the pressure sensitive, again hold the fabric and stabilizer so that you're not putting a lot of strain on the stitched fabric and keep working away at this. And it'll just take a few seconds to get the rest of the excess stabilizer out of the way. I'll show that to you on my next sample piece. You'll maybe have a little bit left over but not much and you're ready to do the stitching. Now if you do not have the embroidery on there, that's just fine, but I'd like to show you now how to do the belt opening, simple stitching, straight stitches, even though it may look a little bit more difficult than it is. I have marked on the rights of the fabric very faintly the opening of the belt, and it was about four inches wide and about, excuse me, a fourth of an inch wide and four inches long. And I also 
recommended that you mark the opening on the wrong side of the fabric. Well, what we found is that you can also have a stitching aid by using gridded paper, gridded freezer paper. It has a shiny back surface. We cut a fourth of an inch strip and I'm going to press this to the underside of my design. This will be so, simply a stitching guide and many of you who maybe worked with quilting before have used gridded paper, gridded freezer paper for a project for st stenciling or stitching around. Well, it also works great for, for assembly. On the right side of this, I have a little facing. It's about two to three inches wide. This one's about two inches wide and longer than the opening. And I'm going to pin this to the right side. So I have right sides together. And I place some interfacing on this piece as well to give it some stability. Now I'm going to sew from the flip side of my sample, stitching around the window opening that I have fused down. This is just going to be there temporarily. I'm going to quickly just move my pins to the wrong side. Make sewing a little bit easier. And then set my machine for a short stitch length. I like to start stitching in the middle of a long edge and sewing with a short stitch length. I'm going to shorten that stitch length just a little bit, especially as I reach the corners. The shorter stitch length will kind of reinforce that area. And so across the edge and then down one edge. And just sew all the way around. Sewing around that paper edge. I'm sewing a little bit into it, but the uh, needle will perforate the paper and just keep sewing. Can't get much simpler than that. Then after doing the stitching, remove the paper and cut through, it's been fused down there pretty good, cut through the opening and just keep on removing the paper. When cutting through the opening on this sample, you'll see that I've flipped to the right side and I've already cut through the center and cut to clips or nip to the corners. And I've already done this on both sides. As I've turned this to the underside, even without pressing, you'll be able to see with just that short stitching around the box area, you have a nice opening, a little pressing, and we'll be ready to go on to our next step. The next updated sewing technique that I'd like to share with you is using a quilt binding technique around the neckline of the first class shirt. Many of you have perhaps put a binding around a quilt edge, and this is the same technique used on a garment. We're cutting a strip on the bias or on the diagonal that's two and a fourth to two and a half inches wide, and wrapping this clean finish of the neckline. Remember, I'm wearing the same pattern, like the pattern I'm wearing is with a collar on it. So you have a couple of various options. You'll see this as a bias because of, we chose a print that uh, would show the bias cut and the little give that it has. And it's important that this piece is cut on the bias so it goes around the curves of your neckline more easily. Meet the cut edges, meeting wrong sides together, and then match the cut edges of the binding to the neckline, extending that cut edge about a half of an inch or so from the folded edge of the neck. Now again, like to pin with those pin heads to the outside. At the, this front, securely wrap the binding around the neckline so we'll have that edge finished and secure with a pin. And I'm going to sew a couple of inches of the neckline for you. You'll find that you'll be using more pins when you're doing this than the traditional seams because you're stitching around a curve. You're molding this bias edge around the curve and it just does take a little bit more time. A straight stitch is what you'll need, but it works best with a fourth of an inch seam allowance, or you should use a fourth of an inch seam allowance, I should say. And to get that, I'm just going to move my needle position to the right. And I have it about at a fourth of an inch, or if you had a presser foot that was a fourth of an inch wide, that would be a good option for you right now. I'll sew that fourth of an inch, and I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. One more time. And then we'll go forward and just mold that trim around the cut edge. And as you're getting to pins, I always like to remove them. And this should give you a general idea of how this works. Now, when I raise the presser foot, remove the fabric, you'll see how this will wrap around the edge. Now I simply move 
the trim upward and then that front edge is all finished and then wrap the seam allowance around the neckline. And I'm going to pin in the well of the seam in that little ditch and gently stitch this down. Now you can either stitch it by hand or I'm going to stitch it by machine using that term that those of us who so like to use stitch in the ditch, stitching in this well so I can attach this from the underside. I'm going to go back to a straight stitching and center needle position is where I'm going back to. And I'll place the fabric underneath the presser foot and sew in that ditch. Remove the pins again as I'm going along. This is a basic, basic technique that you'll use on a multitude of garments and projects, easy to work with, and only takes two stitches or two rows of stitches to complete. On our first class sewing journey, you'll find that almost all the stitching on this top, whether it's the collar version or the collarless version, can be with straight stitching. And I just finished showing you how to stitch the binding around the neckline with a nice simple binding technique. The button loop can also be created just with straight stitching. We went over that in the first program. And you can hand tack that loop to the corner so that you'll have a nice closure. If you'd like, you can use button closures button and buttonhole closures or snap closures if you'd like. For beginner snaps might be the perfect alternative. I'd like to review that button, or I should say belt area, that decorative area. It doesn't have to have the decorative stitching around it, but the closure is what's important right now. The belt pattern can either be cut in half as it is right now or used in, in its entirety. When it's cut in half like this, it's cut in half in its lengthwise position. It is tacked underneath the flap and the seam and then on the outside on top of the flap or on top of the back so that the, back, the belt in the back comes around and the belt in the front is underneath the flap and comes through the opening. What I didn't mention when I was sewing this flap is that after pressing it securely you need to tack down in the corners or around very gently the opening the facing so that you have a nice flat opening. The other option, of course, when working with this belt, let me just undo it here, is to make the belt in one unit and have the belt come around your waistline on top. And we showed this version earlier so that this way the belt is on the top of the flap. The choice is yours. The fun part about sewing is the great designing part. The sleeves have other options than just a straight option. In the pattern I'm wearing, I did not do any extra shaping to the sleeves. I just rolled up the cuffs. But to follow the motif of the rod iron design, we did some stitching on the sleeve, creating a cuff, a fake cuff, sewing the rod iron design, this time with gray thread on the black background. By the way, this was just one fabric. We used the, the wrong side of the fabric, so to speak, for this flap, and we got two different looks. It's a great idea. Now, even if you didn't have embroidery stitching, you could use this modified cuff idea. Here is the sleeve, how wide it is in its entirety, you would measure four inches from the seam and fold the fabric. And after folding the fabric four inches from the seam, place a buttonhole through all those layers. And on this sample, we have stitched the buttonhole through the layers, added a button, and you have a very elegant closure to the lower edge of the sleeve without physically having to add a cuff. Another option would be to cut a strip of fabric that's two and a half by 10 inches and create a tube. Attach a button and buttonhole on opposite ends, tack that in the seam, and again, add the closure to the lower edge. These are just two of the many options that you can use on this great pattern. In the second program of First Class Sewing, I gave you some basic ideas like working with the neckline finish of straight stitching and then creative ideas, adding embellishment around the neckline with embroidery and this great belt opening. We'll be back with more ideas with the designer, Lois Erickson. Here's a hint from Pfaff. For the most accurate of top and edge stitching, use Pfaff's ability to change the needle positions. There are a total of 19 positions ranging from far left to far right, plus many more positions in between. I use the needle position option frequently when using the edge stitch foot. The stitching can be positioned just at your preference. 
I also use the needle position option when top stitching a zipper. I know you'll find many more uses. Here's a hint from Primdritz, the manufacturers of OmniGrid rulers. These precision laser cut rulers give unmatched accuracy. They're made of heavy duty clear acrylic and are perfect for rotary cutting any color fabric from light to dark. OmniGrid's exclusive double sight lines are printed on the underside of the ruler for greatest accuracy in contrasting black and yellow, enabling you to see the measurements you need. Notice the ease of measuring on this pink fabric as well as a dark print. In addition to the straight cutting lines, you'll find degree lines, 60, 45, and 30, allowing you to cut geometric shapes without the use of templates. I think you can see why I use OmniGrid rulers on TV and at home. Here's a hint from Amazing Designs by Great Notions. Sometimes a garment requires subtle embroidery due to the fabric weight or the delicate garment style, like this cotton piquet shell. Amazing Designs suggests looking at embroidery designs with a new eye. Look to see if you can eliminate some colors or elements to get a completely different look. The flowers on this shell are from the Amazing Designs Floral Collection number 5, where they are shown in very large, vibrant flowers. By eliminating all the color except the outline, you have a look that's just right for this garment. Here's a look at Rowenta's Steam Generator, an iron I use in my home and at the studio. The steam generator features a lightweight iron and a 33 ounce water tank for steam on demand. Continuous steam is available at a touch of a button, generating twice as much steam as a conventional iron. I use the vertical steam feature for final pressing and when creating home decorating projects. The steam generator's water tank provides up to one and a half hours of steam without refilling. Now you can see why Rowenta is a choice of professionals. Get ready for Sewing with Ease and Style next on Sewing with Nancy. I'm Nancy Zeman. During the first two programs of this three-part series, I presented updated construction techniques. In this show, we'll take a creative approach. Lois Erickson, designer of the First Class Shirt Pattern, is my guest to share her artistic ideas. Lois, every time I talk with you, you inspire me, and I know you'll do the same for our viewers. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to sharing some creative options with them and encouraging them to be more, more creative if they can and certainly have fun with their sewing. We'll start by incorporating ready-made products as part of the shirt panels. This shirt created by Lois showcases a lovely Japanese hanky in the panels. Linens, tablecloths, and other finished textiles are other options. Discover the joy of sewing next on Sewing with Nancy. During the first two programs of this series, I worked with the first class shirt pattern, a very great style, but with simple sewing techniques, showing you updated sewing ideas. And when working with the pages or panels in the front of the shirt, I just showed you some very simple ideas of clean finishing the edges with a serger, turning under the edges, and top stitching. These pages and panel ideas have great possibilities for design options, and that's where Lois can really share with us some wonderful thoughts. You just saw this shirt, and Lois, this is a beautiful hanky, or you actually mentioned there are two hankies here. Yes, well, one was not quite enough. It had to be two, and they were even a little small, so I had to piece them here, as you can see on the shoulders, and on the other side over there also. The beauty of using ready-made textiles or finished textiles is that some of the sewing is already done for you. That's right. You don't have to do any hemming or any facings or anything like that. The pattern piece that you have obviously has seam allowances allowed in this. And what we have to do is just to turn under or turn under the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance along the top edge, excuse me, the front edge, and then the lower hem area. So you could just turn that under and then let your creativity flow. That's right. Here you have some great examples of textiles. Well, one uh, idea to use is a scarf, and we most of us have many of those that yes. are half the time unused. So this one has fringe on the bottom. This is a silk scarf, but the edges are, of course, finished. And then that lower hem, you could just leave the fringe if you like that hanging down. So again, you can just kind of play with it how you'd like the positioning to be, remembering to allow that five-eighths of an inch to extend beyond the pattern piece and then cut out the rest of the pattern. Mm -hmm. That would work very well. Another one that works very well is a napkin. This is an, uh, a vintage mm. napkin. Lovely. And a nice uh, detail on the edge and a lacy effect inside with all the pulled threads. So that would be your two edges would be finished again for you there. 
This is a tablecloth, a very small one, uh, but it has a wonderful border, and you could uh, use certainly use that to advantage. Really, this is spectacular and we, we pointed out when we were looking at this earlier that as I lay this pattern piece on the tablecloth right in this area on the tablecloth looks like a uh, stain of some sort that probably is never going to come out. Probably not. Probably not. So when cutting the other page you can have an idea there for them. That's right. You can do a long one and you'd even have probably scraps to maybe trim your collar or maybe make some cuffs out of the borders that are left. So you want to utilize everything. I don't think you throw any fabrics away. Not too often, <laughs> not too often. Uh, one item that you, uh, that would be easy to find, and you probably would need two of these because these are fairly small, these are placemats and uh, hand embroidered or Battenberg lace, or, but they, placemats come in a variety of materials, so they would be a, a very good option for using uh, and looking for placemats that would be interesting colors. We're going to glance back at Lois's finished shirt and just show you again how she pieced the panels right in this area. You can see that the shirt was, t or the panel was longer than the hanky itself, and she added a little extra button. But also look at the collar. This asymmetrical collar has so many options. And I know, used I, it. Really, I really like the collar. I think it's flattering on most uh, body types, and it seems like it always looks nice with jewelry and that sort of thing. Uh, but you can piece this. You want to make sure that you piece the inside mm -hmm. because that's the part that folds down. So you want to, you know, I mean, usually you would think about the outside of the collar as sure. being the finished edge. Well, now consider using textiles as part of your sewing projects. It's time to let your creativity take over. Use the pages of this pattern as artistic panels, incorporating unique fabrics, textures, and stitches. Laura Berman created this version of Lois's shirt, making a collage of fabric with a specialty organza. Next, we'd like to show you how to create this collage technique. One thing that I'd like to point out, first of all, is that the sheer fabric that she's used on this other panel has been covering this very bright orangey red to create a wonderful color that more, more goes with this other red. And underneath, she's also added bits of ribbon, and you could add other things like threads, loose threads or whatever, as long as they're stitched down. They are covered with the organza, so it's very protecting. What a change from bright orange to a muted yes. blue red. Mm -hmm. What a great look. Yes. We mentioned that organza is a perfect fabric to use in this designing tool. And here we just used organza as a background and pinned some pieces into place. Right, you just cut randomly whatever size or shape you wish and pin them in place. And then, of course, you will need to stitch them down because they have to be attached there. And then you'll be covering them with a sheer layer as you would this. When you're finished with this, of course, you'd also have to put a mm -hmm. shear on top of this one after the stitching is completed. And the color of the shear can tone down the brightness Absolutely. and the intensity. Now, you stitch down, but you don't have to finish these edges because they will be covered right. with another layer of shear. That's one real plus for using the shears is that you don't have to finish the edges. Now, rather than turning under the edges, zigzagging and top stitching, which would kind of distort this look, Lois now recommends to cut a lining piece the same size as your original pattern, and then stitch the front edge and the lower edge. Right. And then you can turn this right side out. And here we have another sheer combination, just to show you that the facings have the facing has been turned underneath. Now, Lois, this is a hint that I think all of us should incorporate. Mm -hmm. And that's this little piping edge. Yes, it looks like faux piping, and it really is just the facing that you've pressed creatively. Just roll it out a tiny bit as you're pressing, and uh, then you'll uh, see that nice little colored edge. I've just used a very muted uh, fabric on the back, but you could also use something very uh, bright. Uh, could be a print. It could, but it changes the color completely on the sheer part of this uh, panel. So we had a sheer overlay here with obviously the cutouts and what a what a change that gives mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can use the facing idea not just on a very decorative fabric, but one of your students made this beautiful silk top mm -hmm. and she faced the edges. And your student's name is Diane Day. And she faces with a very like a china silk, so it's very lightweight and uh 
in keeping with the way the whole uh, garment is, uh, uh, the fabric for the whole garment is. So the uh, a light fabric for the lining is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. So this facing technique can be used on a multitude of fabrics. Now another thought that you have, which I think is really fun, and that is to use, whoop, is to use a stripe. Well, stripes are uh, a wonderful facing material uh, and as well as a piecing material. So you can just cut up your stripes and sew them back together any way you wish. And in this case, we've lined it with the red, so that little red line is showing at the edge. And as a facing, this same material is used on this next one. Okay. Uh, and it just then shows this very tiny little edge with this dot. So the stripes are uh, a nice little addition to that. Even the button has stripes on, which is kind of a nice connection there, a nice relationship. Now there's an overlay on this panel. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to have something that was a little more dimensional looking. And this was just a scrap. I always like to look at my scraps when I'm uh, mm -hmm. making something. And usually those pieces are more interesting shapes than something you could try to cut. Uh, so I just put facings on the scraps, and they could be uh, a collar piece, or you can, in this case, I've cut the collar edge as the pattern, but the outer edge is whatever shape the scrap is. <laughs> this and is very unique. Look at this little cutout section here. I mean, that is the way the pattern, uh, the uh, scraps were, and they weren't quite long enough, so I had to put two together. So you just keep adding until your piece is big enough. We're showing you here how to add this interesting addition. This is going to be on a cuff, or could be on a cuff. You've cut the lower edge the size of the pattern, but then let the top edge be freeform. Right. The facing is placed right sides together, but you did not cut out the facing shape until after stitching. Right. Well, it kind of keeps it uh, from stretching or getting out of shape uh, any more than it already is, actually. And just apply this on top of the sleeve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what a creative element to, to work in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, we have some other creative ideas this time. Again, Lois has a lot of students who have incorporated some of her pattern pieces or pattern ideas, but then usually come up with, they came up with a new I idea. And this one is using a stripe but mitering it. Right. Mm -hmm. And Cindy Lynch is the uh, designer of this one, and uh, she has chosen to make the collar come down a little more like a V. She didn't like the high neck so much, mm -hmm. so for herself, she just changed that, which is, of course is great to do. You want to be able to uh, modify and change as easily as you can. So we have kind of a tapestry-like fabric, a chambray. What an interesting combination. Mm -hmm. Our next panel for inspiration has texturing in it, some wrinkling. Yeah, this is a lightweight silk, and to wrinkle the fabric, you simply want to, um, you can twist or just roll it into a ball or whatever you want. I usually kind of pleat it in my hands and just twist it like this. So when I steam it uh, on the board, then those wrinkles will be staying in there. Let and that then, dry a little bit. We've pre-steamed this and on twist it. This is fusible interfacing, sticky side up. So then when you spread this out, you can um, pin it in place if you wish, or you can just simply place it on there and then just steam again so you have your wrinkles are just being attached to your <laughs> interface. This is perfect. Yeah. This is uh, a very easy way to be uh, creative. It doesn't take a whole lot of... Uh, ingenuity. You would need to do a little stitching on this panel to hold it down. To yeah, you would. And you could do pattern stitches if you like those, or just a simple top stitching would be fine. And it could be contrasting or metallic thread or whatever you like. And our last two creative ideas for the panel happen to do with stenciling. And we'll quickly go over these beautiful stencil patterns that, this you, again, your students worked with. This one is done by Dawn McIntyre, and uh, she's done a bamboo pattern. And this one is Carol Oliphants, and she's t picked up the colors from the print and made a stencil and, and uh, used that uh, as her design. I know you'll be inspired after seeing these great ideas. I once overheard Lois say, if you're going to only make one closure, make it spectacular. That's what this first class shirt features, one downright spectacular loop and button. 
The button loop is made from self-fabric bias tubing combined with a dynamic looking button. What better way to finish a sewing project with a fun to sew closure? We'd like to start by showing you how to make corded self-tubing. And Lois, we cut a strip about an inch and a half wide, met right sides, and stitched a presser foot width or about a fourth of an inch from the fold. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to add the cording after putting it on the, the tube turner. Right. Well, you just want to lay your cording on the table and it just magically turns itself inside out. And there you have it. Ta-da! <laughs> Ta-da! Now to finish the end, you want to be able to uh, have some kind of a finished, uh, nice looking finished edge there. So you're gonna trim off about an inch or so of the, of the uh, cord. Now you have a little empty space at the end, so you fold that over and you're gonna take a couple of stitches into the cord through the tube, and then you're going to just wrap this very end just like, like that. this. What a nice, neat closure. You right. can do it contrasting thread or right. a matching thread. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. You bet. So that pretty well takes care of that part. The close-up that you saw earlier of the blouse that Lois is wearing had a great button loop, but it's really a Chinese ball button before it was tightened up. And Lois, you can do the magic of showing how to twist and turn. You're going to make a loop there, bring that behind, fold that over. There's diagrams for this in a lot of different publications, and you, you'll probably need a little more mm -hmm. uh, instruction than this, but that is basically it. So you could use any one of these loops as a button loop. And just tack it down. Right. And now that both the ends have been finished already, so. It looks great. Yeah. We have a board showing a, a variety of different closures and just very creative closures. You could purchase cording if you could find the right color. Right. And then there's just a, a glass bead on the end of that. This one has a button from a military school uniform mm -hmm. on it. Uh, a large bead with a knot to keep the uh, cord from falling off. This is a stone donut that has more or less what they call a price tag knot holding that on. And here we have just three different cordings to carry the button loop and then the, these glass bead on the end. Mm -hmm. And just notice her creative well, it's just a very simple knot. I mean, uh, I think a lot of times we try to get a little too complicated with things. This is kind of clever. Uh, this one is a cord with shank buttons, and you can, of course, have a series of those, and then you would slide it down, do your stitching, and then slide the button up in place, and then keep, keep going with that. These are just a few of the options that you can create. And one of Lois's students, again, we showed this shirt earlier due to the stenciling on the front area, but look at this beautiful button loop and how she carried the cording through around the collar and then added mm -hmm. a little and accent. also a little piece on the sleeve so you can kind of continue the idea and mm -hmm. uh, uh, have a nice relationship there between the uh, collar and the cuffs. So the choices are endless. That's true. That's true. Lois has a wonderful collection of buttons and she sometimes stacks buttons. So on this one you can just glue several together and just put a um, snap on the back. That way, if you wanted to change the button, maybe you want to have a different color one on there another day on your shirt, you could do that. Now these are, are really make a statement, don't you think? Yes, <laughs> well, and there was one even larger than that. Well, let's find that one, here yeah. we go. <laughs> okay. Yes, those are so some sometimes buttons. Sometimes when you have a huge button like this, you don't want to have this enormous right. loop. So one method that I uh, figured out was to put a small zipper and when you unzip it you can have any size button here that you want. So you would just be zipping this up underneath the shank part or the uh, sewn part of your button. So if you're into collecting buttons you can simply use a lot of the cording ideas or purchase cording ideas to make interesting loops, mm -hmm. interesting ties, and you can do this as, as you say, make it a spectacular closure. I hope you'll try some of Lois's ideas.
Are you ready to sew? Well, you can try these updated sewing techniques and creative embellishment ideas with Lois's first class shirt pattern, all multi sized for you. Lois, thanks for being my guest. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Happy sewing. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, because creativity is never black and white. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions. Amazing Designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery. Koala Cabinets, designed with maximum storage using minimum space. Rowenta, professional performance and beautiful results for all types of ironing. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.